many people carry around with them heavy burdens. Sometimes those burdens have been hoisted on them by other people. Other times those burdens have essentially been created out of behavior that the person has done. Let me explain what I'm talking about by way of a few examples. I know one young man who's very talented and very bright and seems to have so much going for him. But as I got to know him, he told me that when he was growing up, when he was three, four, and five, he used to play out in the yard and he would sing and he would dance and have imaginary friends and, and do the things that many young children do. But his mother would see this and come outside and yell at the top of her lungs so that everyone in the neighborhood heard. Stop doing that. I don't want a little queer in my house. That young boy learned from a very early age that there was something wrong with him. And today he carries a heavy burden of shame because he was told at a young age that there was something fundamentally wrong with him. There's a woman that I know. She was successful in her career. She has married two children, really loves her husband. Her husband is also very dedicated to his career, but his job required that he travel a great deal. So this woman would often be alone with the kids, raising the kids, and see her husband every few weeks sometimes, it depended. But as she was working, she developed a close friendship with a male colleague at work. They'd have lunch, and eventually they had a brief affair. She felt horrible about it. She never wanted to jeopardize her marriage. She loved her husband and her kids, and she carried guilt about what she had done. And it, it was really eating at her, a very heavy burden for her to carry. Over the years, especially when I did therapy, but also in spiritual direction, I met quite a few people who were sexually abused in childhood. Sometimes that abuse happened within their family from parent or an uncle or older sibling. Other times it happened because of some adult in their life, a teacher, a, a clergy person, a youth leader, being inappropriate and crossing the boundary and having sex or sexual contact. That led to so many different feelings for people, both of shame and guilt. But I also have worked with people who were perpetrators. Perpetrators are generally people who were themselves abused as children. And that cycle of shame and guilt continues from, from abuse through being a perpetrator, and it's just a very complex situation. And wherever that is, whether there is someone abused or someone who perpetrates, there is so much guilt and shame involved in the experience. Guilt and shame are very heavy burdens to carry, and they're not experiences that really do us any good. There are some people who believe that guilt and shame are good things. They think that if you feel guilty or shameful, that it will help you change your behavior, that it will help you see that you've done something wrong. No, that's not the case. Guilt and shame eat at us. They cause us harm, and so they need to be dealt with and addressed in an appropriate way. In this video, I want to talk about guilt and shame and how they impact us, and the steps we need to take to overcome guilt and shame in our life. This is really a great time to subscribe to this YouTube channel as well as to click that bell and begin to be thoughtful about the complexity of guilt and shame. It was about 10 years ago when my mother died. My partner and I cared for my mother for about five years in our home. When she was no longer able to care for herself, we were happy to have her with us and really tried to provide the care that she needed. 
We enjoyed spending time with her, listening to her stories, and having her as part of our life. In that process, she only had one request, and that request was that she be able to die at home. For her, it was very important to be able to pass while she was at home, not in a hospital and not in another facility. In the last few weeks of her life, she was in a great deal of pain. We became part of a home hospice program. And in that program, they provided support and, and tried to work with us. And we, we hired some extra help too, because it was getting more challenging. But it was clear that we weren't able to provide the level of care she needed as she was approaching her death. She was in so much pain and we couldn't get the medication well regulated at home. So in exasperation, I agreed to enroll her into a residential hospice where she spent the last week of her life. And yes, I experienced guilt in doing that. There was only one thing my mother had asked for her care, and I couldn't do that for her. Guilt is an amazing thing. Guilt comes and causes us to be preoccupied with ourselves. It turns us inward, looking down, and causing us to really analyze and spin over the decisions or the things we have done. Sometimes we've actually done things we shouldn't have. Other times we've done the best we could and we just didn't have better alternatives. But whatever it is that we've done, guilt prevents us from appraising the situation properly. Now, you probably heard my story about my mother in the hospice and you thought, well, I don't know why he would feel guilty about that. He did the best he could. And that was indeed true. But I knew that I had to do something to get rid of that guilt. We don't get rid of guilt simply by wishing it away. When we experience guilt, the appropriate response is to identify what's causing the guilt and work to get it out of us. Because if it stays in us, if we continue to feel guilty, it just continues to eat at us. In psychology, we used to use the term neurosis, and guilt leads to a kind of neurotic behavior where you're thinking all about yourself in unhealthy ways, and you're unable to have healthy relationships with other people. When we're trying to work with guilt, it's important for us to take appropriate responsibility for what we actually did. Identifying what was the thing that we did that's causing the guilt, because guilt is related to things we have done. And then based on what we have done, really work to make amends, to mend the relationship, and that may require asking forgiveness or making some sort of restitution or doing something to actively change the dynamic, to restore the balance. And so as my mother was in the hospice program, while she was, you know, she wasn't aware, she wasn't responsive at that point, I sat by her bed, I took her hand, and I apologized for having to make the decision that I knew she never wanted me to make. And I explained to her that I was doing it because I didn't want to see her suffer with pain. And we couldn't manage the pain at home to the degree they were in the residential hospice. I don't know if she heard me. She couldn't respond. And because she couldn't respond, I still felt guilty. So a few weeks after her death, I took time to write a long letter, thanking her for many of the things she did, and again, explaining the decision as clearly as I could. I was trying to write it out, to mend the relationship the best I could, given that she had already died. I'm explaining this because we're not always able to mend the relationship. People die, they move on, 
They may not want to hear from us. But what's important is that we do what we can to work out the guilt and move beyond the guilt. Making amends, mending the relationship, means that we do the best we can to mend it. And that's important for us in dealing with guilt. First, we need to really look and appraise at what we've done that's causing the guilt and take responsibility for that. And then we need to be active in working to make the situation better. Shame. It is particularly insidious. Shame is coming to believe that who you are as a person is somehow broken, flawed, not right, that you're not good enough, that your life isn't worth living. People who experience shame believe that if people really knew who they were, they wouldn't want to know them. They wouldn't want to be with them. Shame is something that comes from outside of us. Other people teach us or cause us to feel shame. As in the story of the young man that I started the video with, whose mother told him that he should feel ashamed of who he is. It can sometimes come from our family, but shame can come from our school years or from uh, other social contexts and friends. It can come from society at large, where society tells us we should be certain ways or do certain things. And it's particularly insidious when shame comes from religion, because many religions will make statements or religious people will make statements that who certain people are, are disordered or fundamentally flawed or sinful, intrinsically evil, demonically possessed. And all of those things do nothing but cause shame. And I want to be clear, when it comes from a religious source, that's spiritual abuse. And we need to begin to label that as spiritual abuse, not just as someone's faith. That's not faith, that's abusive. To create a context for us to understand the bigger picture of overcoming shame, I wanna talk about understanding this whole issue of shame within the context of two wisdom traditions, Buddhism and the teachings of Jesus. Within Buddhism, a fundamental teaching is compassion. In order for someone to show compassion, to have compassion for others, the compassion has to start with self. Self-compassion is about understanding who one is as being as good of a living being as every other living being on the planet. It's about affirming who we are and our uniqueness. So compassion begins with the sense of understanding our own goodness and well-being. And it's extended then to others. The teachings of Jesus are very similar to this. Jesus said that one must love their neighbor as themselves. In other words, to love others, we must first love ourselves. And this is really rooted in the Judeo-Christian understanding of who we are. The book of Genesis is very clear in stating that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God, that the divine being breathed life into human beings, and that we became living souls, containers of the divine, that there's an inner substance, a light within us that's essentially the essence of God. So from that perspective, no human being can ever be less than any other. Every human being has goodness within them. And so overcoming shame is beginning to understand that fundamental fact about who we are. And in Buddhism, 
one of the things that's essential to the Buddhist way of life is right thinking. It's one of the aspects of the Eightfold Path. Right thinking is about correcting the misperceptions we have and thinking properly about ourselves. That's part of it. We learn how to do that in cognitive psychology. There are several schools of cognitive psychology that can help people overcome shame. For instance, there's something called schema therapy that helps people retell their story and re-see their story in a different light. There's rational emotive therapy, which is an older practice that helps people both challenge and rewrite the way they think. Because fundamentally what happens in shame is that a person has been taught to think incorrectly and those thoughts need to change. Shame, when it's left to untreated, continues to fester at a person. It leads to all kinds of mental health issues like depression and anxiety. It brings down a person's physical health and it interferes with relationships. There's an old psychological term that has come back around to use today. That term is a soul wound. Shame and guilt can wound us to the soul. They can cut us so deep that they prevent us from truly being the people we are. And that soul wound needs to be healed. We need to get rid of the guilt and the shame and come into wholeness so that we can have solid, healthy relationships with others as well as with ourselves. Resolving guilt and shame take time for all of us. And we need to be intentional about resolving the guilt and shame. Remember that guilt is about what we have done. Shame is about who we are. In both cases, we need to take responsibility for what's happening in us. And we need to begin to rewrite the programming that's running automatically in us that's tied to either guilt or shame. We can work on rewriting that programming and healing that soul wound that I talked about with the use of therapy. But in addition to that, part of what we can do is maintain a healthy spiritual practice for ourselves. You see, when we're engaging in regular spiritual practice, we're able to settle into who we are most deeply, to allow ourselves to be rooted in the truth of who we are and allow the other pieces to drift off so that we can let go of them. We may let go of them through the help of journaling. We may feel these pieces coming out in our dreams or they may simply begin to disappear as we move into deeper and deeper meditation. All of that is very important for us. Spiritual practice alone doesn't rewrite the programming that we're carrying with us that's essentially defective. Therapy is an important help. Being in relationships with people who love and accept us is another important part but we can learn more about healthy spiritual practice by engaging in regular practice. And to that end, I wanna recommend two videos for you that are part of this channel. The first is Meditation for a Healthier Mind and Body. Both guilt and shame impact our overall health, physically, as well as our psychological makeup. And that video will help you understand some of the impact that healthy meditation, good solid meditation, does to support your health physically and mentally. 
The other video is psychology and your spiritual practice. It's important in your spiritual practice to keep in mind your health. There's a study that's been done. There have actually been several studies that have been done that show that a person's belief system is related to their overall health, physically and mentally. Many of these studies have been done in relationship to what people believe about a deity. People who believe in a deity that is punitive, that's out to get them, that's ready to send them to hell, tend to have higher rates of depression, anxiety, and overall poorer health, particularly cardiac problems. Those who believe in a God that is loving and kind, accepting and forgiving, have less frequency of depression and anxiety, and have overall better health benefits. While this hasn't been studied sufficiently with people who don't have a, a belief in God, it can be, I think, assumed that if you are believing that the universe is a good place, that your life is good, that you have a positive outlook, that that will support your health and well-being. Getting rid of guilt and shame will go a long way in that process. I want to thank you for being here. Be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel, ring the bell, leave me some comments, like the video, share the video, and know that I appreciate hearing from you. Have a really great day.